Today I was going to start a, a new topic. I've been, uh, we finished up uh, a series on understanding the devices of the enemy. And I encourage you to get that. If you can go to the website at some point, it'll be up there. Very good. Uh, even if I say so myself, I was, I found myself going home and listening to all the recordings because it's like, wow, there's some good stuff in there. But anyway, uh, it is, you know, it's the word of God. And uh, coming out of our mouth or someone else's mouth, if it's a received, it has the potential to bring life if we'll give place to it. And that's, that's why I never tire of the word. I, I, I so agree with Job where he said that he esteemed the words of God more necessary than his daily bread. And, and I really understand that more now than I ever did before. And it is awesome because like Jesus said, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And uh, instead of uh, like giving a title to the study, I thought I would just uh, read uh, to us uh, a scripture that was on my heart. And if you will, turn with me to Luke uh, chapter 7. This is a, uh, this is an awesome portion of uh, scriptures. I'm going to start in verse 36, and it says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. You know, every time I read that, I crack up. It says, uh, which was a sinner, as if there was no one else in that city that was a sinner. You know, it's just how it's, it, how it's they put that in there. Uh, and uh, verse 38, uh, verse 37 again, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner." And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, you know, I always get blessed with this. It says, Jesus answering him. Now, Simon didn't say a word to Jesus, but he perceived what he was thinking in the guy's heart. Isn't that awesome? You know, how often does that happen to you when you're thinking something about something and then all of a sudden the Lord will like give you the answer or lead you in a direction or you'll read a scripture and you're like, wow, are you reading my mind, Lord? You know what I mean? In the NLT it says, he answered his thoughts. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And he did. He said, uh, and Jesus answering said unto Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Okay, just stop for a second. Why did Jesus put it that way? Why did he say, which one will love him most? Just kind of let that hang there in your mind for a minute. That's, that's, it's like, why did he ask that question? Uh, and Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst anoint, but, th but didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my, my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, 
Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Wow, that's pretty rich, isn't it? Uh, what Jesus is saying there. But I, I, the thing that spoke to me that I kind of want to cover a little bit here today is Jesus said unto her, uh, Jesus said in verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. You know, a uh, couple of points. This man said, if Jesus was a prophet, he would know that this woman was a sinner. So did Jesus know she was a sinner? Oh, yeah. But how did, how did this man think that Jesus should have received a sinner? Obviously not how he was. What does that say about the Pharisee's heart? See, he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have done anything to help the sinner up. He would have just avoided them or run them away. But what did Jesus do? Knowing that she was a sinner, what did he do? He received her. He allowed, yes, see, he, he knew more about her than just she was a sinner. Amen? She looked at, he looked at her not according to what she had done, but according to what? Her heart. See, he perceived his, her heart in the same way he perceived the thoughts of the, the Pharisee. Amen? Simon. And he said uh, in verse 47, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now, if you were to read this, uh, I remember I used to stumble over this. Uh, when I struggled with, uh, you know, am I saved or not saved? Because it says, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. And it almost makes it sound like because she loved, she was forgiven. Is that how it works? Do you have to love God before he forgives you? Is that required? Is that a requirement? Okay, how can you love him if you don't know him yet? Well, let me ask a question. What does it mean to love the Lord? What would you say it means to love the Lord? Wait, 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 too many hands. Wait a minute, just hold back. Okay, now, one at a time. What does it mean to love the Lord? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Ah, isn't that the farthest thing from our mind, though? When... She said, uh, if you love me, Jesus said in John 14, that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But he made another profound statement prior to that. Go with me to there, John 14. I, I gotta say, this is probably one of my, I have many favorites, but this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, is John 14. Oh, where shall I start? Uh, just start in uh, verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself unto him. Notice, see, it's not just keeping the commandments, because look at the, this Pharisee that Jesus is speaking with in Luke 7, He's keeping a law. See, he's separating himself from sinners. 
because he doesn't want to defile himself. So in his mind, he is keeping a law. He's keeping a commandment. But is he keeping the commandments? Okay? So it's not enough just to pick and choose. When this says, he that hath my commandments, how do you get the commandments? Where do the commandments come from? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Where, where are the commandments that we can have? Are they the ones written on our heart? Well, there's two places. There is, the, there is you know, that I'm thinking of. In uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it says that, that the Gentiles, they do the law, even though they have not the law, they do the law. How do they do the law? It goes on to say that God wrote that law in their heart. Do you know that that's written in every man's heart? Every man's heart it's written in before they ever learn anything. Uh, my mom used to babysit when I was growing up in high school. She had eight kids and then she wanted to babysit. It's like, go figure. <laughs> I could never figure that out. She loved kids, I guess. So anyway, I would sit there, you know, getting ready for school, eating my breakfast, and I just watched the kids, you know, kids are very entertaining. So they had like these three, two, three, and four year olds, you know, that mom dropped off to get ready to go to work or whatever. And they're playing. And what I observed was even a three year old, as he's picking up this block, he'll look around and he's looking all around and then he'll throw it. <laughs> it's like, what's making him look around? What is it? Fear of getting caught. See, what? Fear of getting caught. Yeah, but why would it matter? If he didn't know that that was wrong, why would it matter? Why would he look around? See, where is that written? See, that's written in his heart. He knows that he's departing from what is right. You know, I remember the day I lost the Spirit of God. I was four years old. And I climbed up on that sink to get to my dad's razor that I, he told me don't ever play with. But, you know, everybody was outside in the pool, you know, in the backyard. So I thought I'm safe. And the moment, the moment I opened that up and cut myself, I still have a scar today. Uh, the moment I cut myself, fear entered into me. And for the first time in my life, I had fear. I was never afraid before, ever afraid before. But that fear entered into my heart in a different way. Now, I was afraid of things like, you know, when the back box, the boxer that lived across the fence would jump our fence. I mean, I would take off like, then I ran as fast as I had to, not as fast as I could. And I would always escape. But uh, that was a different kind of fear. Now I had a fear of judgment when I cut myself. And I wasn't afraid of God. I was afraid my mom was gonna kill me. You know, it's like the cut didn't matter at all. I'm bleeding to death, you know, and, and I'm worried my mom's gonna kill me, you know. But anyway, so the, the, the point I'm making is that in that moment, I knew that I violated something that was greater than just don't, don't play with that razor, okay? And so there is a law. The, there's the law written on our heart. And then God was so kind uh, to the Israelites. They had gotten so far away from following that law that was written in their heart that God wrote it down. He wrote it down in a way where it would be a testimony not only against them, but for them. Remember, he said in Deuteronomy that this law was higher than any of the other nations laws and that the other nations would marvel at the wisdom in that law. Now, did God give them that law to keep so that they could be saved? No. What did he give them that law for? It, it tells us. It says because he loved them. And he was, he was revealing his heart to them. You know that God lives by that law? See, God wrote down for them how he lives. And he said, and if you live like this, you're going to be blessed. You're going to have everything that I've provided, uh, you're going to be a partaker of. 
through just following that law. Now, did they have to keep it to the letter, to the T, in order to be a partaker of that? No, not at all, because their salvation wasn't in keeping the law. It was in honoring God. Amen? Amen? So when it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So this woman, back to uh, Luke chapter 7, this woman, was she keeping all the commandments? Was Jesus saying that it's in order to be saved that you have to wash his feet with your tears? That you have to anoint his feet with a precious ointment? No. What was it though? Notice what he says here. In verse... Um, In verse uh, 50, he says, And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Where was her faith? In, the, in this illustration, now put yourself where Jesus is and this man. How did Jesus recognize this woman's faith? The fact that she came to him. Mm -hmm. Did she even mention a word? Did she even say, save me? Did she say any of that? What was in her heart, though? What did Jesus see in this woman's heart? He saw repentance in her heart. He saw her, her, she was overwhelmed by two things. One was her consciousness of her sin. And number two what would you say the number two thing was? Jesus. Savior. You know the name Jesus means Savior? And when she heard that Jesus was in the house, what did she do? She needed a Savior. And so what did she do? She went and she did the only thing that she probably knew to do. Was she showed her what? Her affection. Her her uh, heart revealed to Jesus. And she was weeping not to get forgiveness, but because why? Because she felt forgiven. She felt relieved. Notice, go back to this parable. It's, it's very important. And, and I'm just going to, I'm just kind of throwing some things out there because I want to go into, into this a little bit deeper. But I'm just going to throw some things out there for us uh, to like, you know, Stir the waters, you might say, just to get us thinking, okay? Um, Jesus said in verse uh, 47, he says, Wherefore I say unto their, her, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. You know the word for there, um, how would you describe it? It's like... Um, it's like a causative, I guess you would call it. Uh, it's like, um, therefore, therefore she loved him much. Think of it in that, let me read it in that context. It says, um, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Therefore, she loved much. And how do we know that that would be an accurate substitution there? Well, because... Jesus, when he gave the parable, he asked about the man who had, um, the man who forgave the two debtors, the one 500 and the other 50. And he said, which one loved him more? And he said, the one to whom he forgave most. And he said, thou hast rightly uh, answered. So when it says here, her sins, which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So we could say that he was saying, because of her understanding and her acceptance that her sins are forgiven, she loved him much. In the same way that if you were forgiven a great debt, you would be very appreciative, very thankful, very... Uh, you would, you would love that person much. Has anyone ever been forgiven of a, like a really heinous uh, crime or a, a terrible thing? 
Yeah, I see sh head shaking, no. Folks, let me, uh, let me enlighten you. The Bible tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Why were we dead? Because our sins are a heinous crime. Against whom? Who did we sin against? Your neighbor? Your friends? Your mother? Your brother? Your sister? No. You sinned against God. You sinned against God. You know, reminds me of a... Um, Caroline and I had some friends from the Ukraine. And uh, this uh, one gal, uh, her, her mother was very... Uh, she had gotten born again, and she was all about Jesus. But she raised her children under the communist, um, in that communist environment where there is no God, and um, you know you're your own God. And uh, so she, her daughter didn't believe at all in God. She says, "No, there there is no God." And then one day, you know, we had, we ministered off and on to her, you know, whenever we'd see her. And so one day. We were over there and uh, I just felt led to ask her. I said, have you ever sinned? And she stopped for a minute and she said, well, yes, everyone has sinned. Now here's someone that doesn't believe in God and here she's saying, everyone has sinned. And I said, I said, well, who did you sin against? It was amazing, the look on her face. And she said, well, I guess God. <laughs> Someone that didn't believe in God came to that conclusion. How did she come to that conclusion? There's a law that was written in her heart that was accusing her. Okay? Was it condemning her? No, it was just saying, hey, you haven't measured up. You haven't hit the mark. What do you think drove this woman to Jesus? Was it because everyone rejected her as a sinner? No, she, if, if, because he knew she was a sinner, uh, it's possible she might have been a prostitute, okay? Known in the city as someone who's a sinner, okay? So she, even though she's judged by these people, if, let's just say, hypothetically, she is a prostitute, she's profiting from her sin. It's sustaining her, true? Okay? So you could easily justify, well, this is my source of income. God said he wouldn't work, neither should he. You know what I mean? You could have all this rationalization going on in your mind to justify your position, true? But what was greater than all that was her consciousness of her sin. That consciousness of her sin drove her, drove her when she heard that Jesus was there. What, what was it about that? You know, it's interesting that Jesus used that illustration of a debt. There was a debtor, you know, these two debtors owed this one person 500 or 50. They both were debtors. They both owed but the one who had the greater debt was the one who was most appreciative and loved the most. And consider this. He used that to illustrate that when we commit sin, it is a debt. True? That's the same point that Paul made. I think it's in uh, 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 Romans chapter 6. He says that the wages of what? Sin is death. In other words... The wage that you're paid through your sin or the debt that you accrue through your sin is what? Death. It's separation from God. This woman was well aware of her separation from God. Okay? How many of you, when you became born again, when you accepted Christ at your, as your Savior, felt like a weight lifted off of you or felt like, yeah, yeah, even when I was I think I was probably six or seven years old when I called on the Lord. It's just like before that point, whenever my mom would say, you're a sinner going to hell, you better say your prayers before you go to bed. Man, that would just like give me the willies. <laughs> you know, I just like, whoa, you know, like, so I wouldn't forget my prayers. But at some point when I called on the Lord, 
it didn't have the same impact when she would say that. It's like there was something that, there was a relief that I had in my heart that I was not aware of until I accepted Christ as my Savior. Amen? And uh, that's what we see with this woman here, that she was so conscious, so conscious of her sin that it drove her to break this very expensive ointment and just pour it out on Jesus freely and to weep behind him without any concern. How many of you would go into somebody else's house uh, to their dinner party and just step behind somebody and start crying and washing their feet with your tears? How many of you would do that? <laughs> wow, that's great. No one. No. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. I want you to put yourself in this woman's shoes, the consciousness of her sin and a way of escape from that consciousness gave her power to go beyond all the socially accepted norms to do what? To get to Jesus. Why? To beg him for something? No, just to receive what he had without saying a single word. Think about that. You know, Jesus is the same today. Mm -hmm. Identically the same today. We, we don't have to approach him, you know, on bended knees or, or offering what we can with the works of our hands or with crying and with prayers and with supplication. We don't have to approach him that way. It's not necessary. Why? Why? Yes, he receives us because we are what? Sons. We're sons and daughters. Yes, he receives us. We can go in at any time. Think about when you were a little kid. Did it matter to you if, if your parents had someone over to the house and you needed something, you got a little boo-boo, you just run right into their, <laughs> their gathering and you, oh, you know, and what would mom and dad do? Oh, they'd attend to you immediately. They'd interrupt the whole thing. Why? That's what love does. Amen? So Jesus allowed this to happen. Why? Because he was showing the heart of his father. What was the heart of his father? God so loved the world. Was she part of the world? Yeah. And so Jesus just in that moment, just received what she was doing to him. Amen? He understood the consciousness that she had of her sin, even though he had no sin. He understood that that's what she was there for. She wanted to receive deliverance from that consciousness. How do we know that Jesus knew she was conscious of that? What would you say was the, the thing that tipped it off for him? And why he just sat there while she did all that and enjoyed his dinner and didn't say, no, 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 don't, you don't have to do that. No, no. Oh, don't waste that. We could sell that and give it to the poor. Just give it to me, you know, the, the ointment. Why didn't he do that? Why? These are good questions, huh? Yeah, why? Why do you think? Well, he gives us a, a pretty uh, good hint here in verse 50. He says, and he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. And then what's the last three little words? Go in peace. See, she didn't come in peace, did she? No, she, she had something that was causing her heart great distress. And what was that? Her consciousness of her sin. Amen? But when she, but when she, somewhere in that process of the tears and the wiping with the hair and the breaking of the oil, you know, do you think her ear was deaf to what Jesus was sharing to Simon? No, she probably heard the whole thing. Can you imagine what comfort it brought to her? when she heard him say, and the debtor frankly forgave, I mean, the, uh, 
the master or whatever, frankly forgave them both, the great debt and the small debt. And then when he said to Simon, he said, you know, when I came in, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me any water for my feet. You ne never kissed me once, you know. You didn't anoint my head with oil. But look at all this woman has done. And he said, because her sin was great, she has loved much. Would she love because her sin was great or because she realized she was forgiven of a great debt? Amen? And, you know, I, I want to talk about in, in the next uh, few studies that we'll get into is sin consciousness. Your consciousness of your sin can be a, can be a wedge between you and the deliverance that God has worked for you in Christ Jesus. Your awareness of your sin can separate you from all the benefits that God has provided for you in Christ. You know, and, and that appears that, I mean, that shows up in many different ways in our life. Like when I was very, very sick, if you would have said to me, uh, oh, you know, um, uh, you know you're, you're just suffering from condemnation. I said, no, and I would have quoted all the scriptures. You know, I'm forgiven of my sins. I'm redeemed, my sins are as far as the east is from the west. I would say all that because I knew that's what the scripture said. But you know what? They didn't comfort me. Those, those scriptures weren't a comfort to my soul. You know how I know they weren't a comfort to me? Because I kept looking for deliverance. I kept seeking the healing. And what led me to seek the healing? Well, I kept looking at my present condition and thinking that I needed something. So what did the enemy do? Well, the enemy's right there to say, yeah, you're sinning or you did sin. And, and you know, or you've crossed the line here. Okay. And then I had all my dear Christian friends who loved me so much and really wanted to see me delivered would come and tell me about all my sin. And that's why I was still sick and how I needed to be delivered. Can you imagine how that made me feel? Well, just tell me how you feel about it. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel like, well, maybe I did. You know, maybe that is the breach between me and God. Mm -hmm. And then I would read scriptures in like John 9, God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worth worshiper of God and doeth his will... Him God heareth. What do you think that moves a person in their heart? They think they're a sinner. They think they're a sinner. And now they think God's not hearing them. So what do you do if you're conscious of your sin? What's the natural reaction? To draw away from God. It, yeah, it can be. You can feel like the bar is so high that why even try? You know, and, and even had somebody who comforted me with these words. Well, well, Mike, you've rejected God's deliver his uh, correction so much. Maybe you're reprobate and he won't hear you at all. Okay, okay now to them, that's like helping you. But do you know where that's coming from? Consider the other person who's coming to share that with you. See, we share with other people what we have received in the abundance of our heart, okay? So if someone, if someone is coming to you and telling you that you're reprobate or God's not hearing you, what do you think they're believing in their own heart? That they're reprobate. Yeah, that they might have blown it and they better cover their tracks or whatever, okay? Think, think about that. You know, Jesus was this, the one who said... Um, uh, in uh, go back with me one chapter in, ch in chapter six, he says of, chap of Luke in chapter six. Let's see. I think I wrote that down. In uh, verse, um, uh, verse 35, he says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again and your reward shall be great. You shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind 
unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. You know, if you feel condemned in your heart, that's what you're going to be ministering to other people. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is speaking. If you feel forgiven, you're going to be encouraging others to receive the forgiveness that God has for them. Amen? You know, when I, uh, when I received uh, healing and uh, just accepted it, even though I didn't see any change in my physical body, you know, one of the first things that I noticed was that I was, prior to that moment, a very judgmental, a very critical person. Because the moment I felt free from condemnation, from guilt, and from judgment, when I felt free from that, I knew I was healed. And I saw how what the way I was feeling that God was towards me, I was passing that on to everyone else. And man, it really humbled me in that moment. I felt like, oh my goodness, I have been so critical and judgmental of people. But you know how I did it? I did it scripturally. I was a good Pharisee. <laughs> I used the word of God. I used the law scripturally, you know. Uh, but I was still wrong. And it was my consciousness of sin, my consciousness of guilt and wrongdoing that kept me from just receiving the grace, the wholeness, the healing that God had provided for me in Christ Jesus. Why? Because I was judging myself. Instead of accepting that I was judged in Christ, that he bore the full judgment, the full penalty of my sin. And when I understood that, I saw that what Jesus did was enough, that there was no judgment against me. You know, that's the point that Paul is making. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. In uh, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. You know, folks, there's no judgment against you. None whatsoever. I remember after I received healing and I was going through this thing about seeing how free I was and that there was no judgment against me at all, I can't tell you how free I felt. I mean, I really felt like, man, I, I, I can do anything. In fact, I had the Abraham discussion with God. I might have shared this with you before, but it's good. I'll share it again. Uh, I, I said to God, as I was meditating on this freedom, I, had, I said, what if I just, of my own you know, free will, my own volition, just picked up a gun and went and shot somebody dead. I said, what, what would you do? And I, I didn't hear anything, but I felt like this head, just like, like he was just shaking his head, like, no, nope, that's not going to change anything. And so I upped the ante. I said, what if I just, you know, did the, the school thing and just, you know, intentionally went out and just murdered like 20 people in one room? Now, I'm, I'm really... I'm like pushing the envelope here, you know? And I got that same reaction, like, nope, that's not gonna do it. And then I said, what if I just like took a bomb and just blew up a whole city? And then the Lord spoke this to my heart. He said, for my status to change with him, Jesus' status would have to change. Now you can imagine I got Holy Ghost bumps right now. Uh, thinking about that. In that moment, I understood 
that there is no judgment against me because I am in Christ. I am in Christ. What God was saying was for me to judge you over one sin would mean I would have to judge my son again. And would that be possible? No. He was raised incorruptible. Amen? That means every sin, past, present, and future, God placed on his son. Okay? That means there's no judgment against us whatsoever. And you know that any thought of that, the enemy wants to use against you for the purpose to keep you from walking in the inheritance that's rightfully yours. That's his whole motive, okay? He wants you to be aware of your sin, okay? He's the one that'll point it out to you. Why? Because... What's just a natural rea- reaction when we do something wrong? What's like the first thing we want to do? We want to do something right to make up for it, right? And usually it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I really, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that. I, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? You know, right? Because we, we don't want to feel like we did something wrong. And, and oftentimes we'll find ourselves like maybe buying a gift or sending a card or something to the person because we're still conscious of what we did wrong. Why? There's just something in us that wants to do something right for what we've done wrong. True? You know that's sin consciousness? Instead of just being like, because don't you feel guilty if you like were just to murder somebody and say, I'm forgiven. <laughs> it just doesn't compute with us, does it? It's like, no, that's no, that doesn't. It's like till, you know, that that doesn't work with us. Why? Because we really haven't got to this place where that woman in Luke chapter seven was. Who valued the forgiveness so much that it didn't matter to her what anyone thought about what she was doing. Going into a perfect stranger's house and going to someone she'd never met before. But she went to where the forgiveness was. What do you think was directing her there? Some word she heard? No, the Spirit of God was leading her to the redemption that she desired to receive. Amen? And not a single word was exchanged other than Jesus just affirmed to her that it took her steadfastness, her faith, to embrace what God had provided for her in Christ. He says, you've received it. Go in peace. Don't worry about it anymore. Did he tell her, now don't go back to sinning? Did he tell her that? Well, he missed a perfect opportunity. If she was in church somewhere, the the pastor surely would have said that. True? But did Jesus say that to her? No, because her status with him did not hinge upon her performance, did it? Just what? The repentance in her heart. Do you remember the first sermon uh, after the resurrection in Acts chapter 2, where, where Peter preached that scorcher? Do you remember that? Let's go there. Acts chapter 2. Listen to the conclusion. Let's see here. You know, uh, Peter explained how that God judged Jesus for the sin of mankind. He said that, that God made Jesus an offering for them. 
that he was judged in hell in their place and that God raised Jesus up having loosed the pains of death. Jesus was in pain when he was separated from his father. Where do, where do you go if you're separated from God? Where do you go? You go to the only place that's separated from God. Where's that? That's a place called hell. That's the only place where the Spirit of God has no presence at all whatsoever. People talk about hell on this earth. There's no such thing. There is none. Because the Spirit of God is everywhere in this earth. There's only one place where the Spirit of God is not. And what is the fruit of that? Well, you can read Luke 16 and see that that rich man that was in hell was in torment. He was in burning not because he was thirsty or because there was a physical flame, he was a spirit, but because there was an absence of the spirit of God there. And without that present, there is torment, folks. You're in darkness, complete, total, utter darkness, separation from God. And Peter says in this sermon that that's what Jesus endured for us. But God saw that he was not guilty for his own sin. Therefore, he raised him up. And after he, he ministered that whole sermon, listen to what they said. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the disciples, men and brethren, what shall we do? What verse were you? I'm sorry, I was in verse... Uh, Verse 37. Wow. See, they wanted to know what can we do? They found themselves guilty. They found themselves, bef they maybe never realized it till that moment. Why Christ came, why they needed a Messiah, because they were sinners. The judgment that he took for them, they have awaiting them unless they accept his payment for them. That's why they said, what must we do? And what did Peter say to them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the what? For the remission of sins. Do you know, this wasn't a new idea. This started in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, did God say, well, you blew it. I said that if you eat of the tree, you're dead. No, when they ate of the tree and were separated from God, who came to them? God. God came to them. And what did he do? Say, well, you blew it. I, I'm going to be working on plan B. So out of the garden. No, what did he bring to them? The Bible says in, in uh, Revelation 13, 8, that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, God slew his son in type and shadow, the lamb, and made them coats of skin. How do we know that they got saved? How do, they know, how do we know that, that Adam and Eve actually received the forgiveness that God offered them? Yeah, they received those coats of skin. But what did they do before they received those coats of skin? They made their own covering. The consciousness of their sin led them to a work. To do what? To cover their own sin. And what did they use? They used leaves, the works of their own hands. To deliver them. Do you know in that, uh, in Luke 7, where Jesus is speaking with Simon, what was Simon trusting in? Simon was trusting in the works of his own hands. He, he's, there was something in him that moved him to ask Jesus to have dinner with him, you know? True? So there was some some perception of a need that he had that Jesus could fulfill. Okay? So in his way, he was the, probably the guy that was forgiven of the $50 debt. But here she came, the 500, something she couldn't pay. But you know, neither one of them could pay 
their creditor. So whether it's 50 or whether it's 500 and you can't pay, does it really matter? No, you're both in the same boat. Amen? And Jesus is saying, Jesus was showing Simon, who did call on him or invited him, that he had a debt too that he had to pay. Amen? But he wasn't as conscious of it. Why? Yeah, he was still thinking that it was the works of his own hands that was going to somehow uh, have him or gain him status with God. Why else would he have turned up his nose and say, well, if this guy were a prophet, he should know that she was a sinner. Instead of thinking, wow, if he's a prophet, he knows I'm a sinner too. (laughs) Think about it. Did he ever, did that thought ever cross his mind? No. Why? Because his status rested in him and his works. He was a Pharisee. What was a Pharisee? What was a Pharisee? Someone who kept the law, someone who was looked up to as a, as a law keeper, uh, someone with knowledge, someone higher than the, than the other people. But did he need a savior? Mm -hmm. Just as much. But he he wouldn't humble himself like this woman did. Amen? Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? Go back to Luke chapter 7. Verse 47, he says, Wherefore I say in her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. How many of you have heard that from the mouth of Jesus to your own heart? See, when you hear that from the Lord, you will go in peace. You won't be conscious of your sin. You won't be looking at what you did wrong if you get a symptom in your body of some sickness. You won't be commanding and rebuking because that's what you're supposed to do when these things happen. Because you know what? You'll know that you're forgiven and you'll be at peace. You'll say, Father, how did you want me to respond to this? You won't be carrying the burden. You won't be trying to get free. Why? Because there's no reason why you should be bound. Because you are forgiven. Amen? There's no judgment against you. There's no condemnation. Why? Why is there no condemnation to you? Why? Because you're in Christ. You know why God placed you in Christ? Why did he do that? Why didn't he just make a third seat and say, now here's where all my other children go? Why didn't he just make another seat? You know, God can do anything. Why didn't he do that? Because he never wanted to be separated from us. Never, ever, ever again. So he placed us in his son so that could never happen, ever. See, that's what that woman received. See, that woman went and she felt free. I remember one time I was just so condemned. I never wept so hard in my life. My whole body was just shaking because of condemnation, okay? And I contrasted that feeling from the day that I understood that there was nothing that I could do to separate myself from the love that God had for me in his son. Wow. I was so conscious of my sin. But over here, I knew I was a sinner, but I, was, I had become more conscious and had received the deliverance from that 
in Christ Jesus. In other words, I accepted my status that God gave me, and I esteemed that greater than the, the status I had prior to that, which was being uh, conscious of my sin. Let me read one more scripture and I'll let you go. I'm going to Hebrews. Chapter 9 or 10. I'll let you know when I get there. I'm in uh, chapter 9, verse 23. And I'm, I'm kind of just using the shotgun approach this morning, you know, where I hit everything at once, <laughs> you know. And uh, I'll get out to 22 later and I'll just pick out the individual targets. But I'm just kind of throwing all this out here uh, to, sh to uh, give us something to think about and chew, it, chew on. And I want to come in and focus in on some of these very important points about uh, condemnation and uh, how we see ourself and, and how that makes a difference in what we're able to receive or not receive of the inheritance that we already possess. Amen? Listen to this. In, I'm in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. It was... and. You'd have to go back to like chapter eight where he, he does a summary of the first seven chapters and he's talking about all the types and shadows uh, in the law, the sacrifices, the temple, you know, the priesthood, all of that were types and shadows. And this is the statement that he makes. It says, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things, the things in heaven should be purified with these, speaking of those types and shadows, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not just to be, appear in heaven, but he's there for us, for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Wait a minute. Come on. It says, see, this is where we know the Bible's not true because it says to put away sin. How many of you in this room are still sinning? No, no, no. You don't have to admit it here. <laughs> I thought sin was put away. I'll let you hang there. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Well, I remember the... I remember the moment that I, this clicked for me in my mind and heart. Where was the first place that I saw Jesus? I saw him hanging on a tree, nailed to a tree with a crown of thorns in his head. That's the first place I saw him. Do you know what it means to be hung on a tree? In Deuteronomy 21, verse 21, it says, whoever you hang on a tree is cursed of God. It wasn't just the Roman form of execution. It was God showing that he made his son a curse for us. So when I first saw Jesus, like all the other Jews, he was cursed of God. For who, though? For himself? For his own sins? Even the testimony of the three on the tree, the one that was with him said, 
This man hath done nothing wrong. We're here because of our sin. We are cursed of God. But he said, this man hath done nothing. How did he know that? See, he was listening to the Spirit of God too, even hung to a tree. It's a good example for us. When you're nailed to a tree somewhere, don't shut out the Holy Ghost because he's going to be telling you a way to get out of your jam. Amen? Amen. And he says here, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time. You know, the second time I saw Jesus, he was risen from the tomb. He was out of the grave. He had come back from hell. What did that mean for me? That means I'm, there's no more sin. I'm free from sin. If Jesus rose, it means that there was someone else's sins that he died for. Not his own. If he had died for his own sins, he'd still be there. But he was cursed of God for who? For me. And when, it ro when he rose up, that's why Peter said in Acts chapter 2 that God raised him up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden to it. Why? Because it wasn't his sin. So the second time I saw Jesus, he was without sin. He wasn't on the tree anymore. What does that mean for me? Salvation, folks. Salvation for me, salvation for you. Is salvation just mean freedom from sin? Yes, that's part of it. But it also means the consequences of that sin have been dealt with too. The judgment has been paid. That means we are free. We are free. If we weren't free, then why? Why do we why do, we break the, why do we break the bread? If it was just a matter of sin and not the consequences, we would just drink the wine. But the body was broken. Why? For our flesh. For us here in this physical realm. The consequences of our sin. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. Well, I'm going to leave you with that note and we'll pick up on this next week.